Welcome to CPS Trader's live webinar. I'm presenting today. We're joined by upfront Josephine Haste, and Josephine is the policy advisor for ethics and professional standards with CPA Australia. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and say good day to you, Josephine. How are you? Very well, thanks, Michelle, and, and yourself. Very well indeed, thank you. And I'll leave you to go ahead and introduce Chana to the team. Thanks so much, Josephine. Thanks very much, Ms. Michelle. It's a pleasure to be with our members today to discuss latest topical issues with the APSB CEO, Chana Widjasing. Chana is the CEO of the APSB and has been with the APSB since its in inception over 12 years ago. Chana manages the implementation of the board's strategy, national and international stakeholder engagement, operations and technical work program, which makes him incredibly busy and in high demand. He functions as the chair of the board's task forces and has overseen the issue of the APSB suite of 21 pronouncements for the Australian accounting profession. Chana also represents the APSB at the IESPA National Standard Setters Group. And it is an absolute pleasure to have you with us today, Chana. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, uh, Josephine. Uh, it's nice to be here. And uh, I think we'll be talking about some very topical issues in this webinar. We will, actually. We'll, we'll touch on the restructured code, which has an operative date of January 2020. So some of the issues that we'll touch on today, our members may have already uh, had the pleasure of learning about over previous webinars that we've done during the year. But for those members who haven't uh, delved, delved into the restructured code, you can access those webinars via our YouTube links and our website if you want more in-depth technical analysis of the changes to the code. So we'll be discussing the restructured code. We'll also be discussing recent changes to APES 330, which is insolvency services. We'll be looking at the task force activities on APES 230, which is financial planning services, a very topical issue given the outcomes of the Hain Royal Commission. And we'll also look at the PJC inquiry and the APSB's approaches to the APS to the PJC inquiry into audit quality, which is a, a huge issue for our profession at the moment. Yes, that's right. Quite wide-ranging uh, topics today, so we might as well get started. Absolutely, we should. So going to our first question, the restructured code delivers the most extensive changes to the code in approximately 20 years. Tell us what is the global context for these changes, Chana? So uh, the context for most of these can be traced back to the GFC. Uh, the regulatory community was very unhappy post the GFC uh, because some of the issues should have been picked up and reported. Um, and a lot of the changes you see, the restructure itself, uh, then audit partner rotation, no non-compliance with laws and regulations, all of them can be traced back to the GFC. So what you see now in the code um, is a very comprehensive and enforceable document. Uh, some might say historically it's a bit wishy-washy. I don't think it's no, any longer that it's wishy-washy, so people have to be very careful. Um, the separation of the requirements and guidance is something APSB supports. Uh, it's consistent with our other standards. And the last time ISBA looked at this, we actually lobbied to have it separated because it's much more clearer than what the requirements are. So that is something that we strongly uh, support. And the code, while it, in Australia it will be effective from 1st January 2020, the reality is that most of the international network of firms have already adopted it because the international start date is 1st July 2019. Um, so uh, I think uh, we can also say what's happening in the UK as well. Uh, the parliamentary inquiries there after the collapse of Carillion, that was a seven billion pound collapse. Uh, KPMG was the auditor for 19 years. Uh, before that, I mean in various forms, all the big four provided services to the company, so that's why you can see that there are a number of UK reviews uh, going on at the moment, um, and the key one is the Bryden review, which is scheduled to come out in uh, December. Uh, and actually, I think earlier this week, uh, Sir Bryden was speaking at, at a conference, 
at the ICAW in UK, and he has made the point that um, boards and management need to be responsible because the auditor is not running the company. So there is a like stakeholder expectation that the auditor is responsible when the auditor is not responsible. Mm. The auditor is responsible if they did not pick up going concern issues or they did not properly audit a balance, but that is separate from the actual running of the company. That's of particular interest, I think, to our members, some of which will be on this webinar, that really 70% of our professional accountants are not based in audit. They're based in services other than audit. And a wide variety of these members will also be involved in preparing the accounts. And that is, I think, a very important piece to this puzzle that I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit further when we look at the PJC inquiry. But it's around ensuring how do we make sure that there's responsibility taken at the preparation end and not just the audit end as well. Yeah. I mean, if you look at our prof profession, um, only 7% are auditors. 23% mm. uh, provide other services, and as you say, 70% are professional accountants in business. Mm. And these are the financial controllers, accountants, CFOs, and even the public sector and academia. Mm. And they're preparing these accounts. They are preparing the accounts. That's right. So I think we have to take responsibility across the financial reporting chain, not the person who comes right at the end mm. uh, once everything is done. Um, for a short amount of time. For a yeah. short amount of time when there's somebody running the thing the whole year. Correct, yeah. So I think there's some balance that needs to come into the debate. Um, and I mean, uh, Sir Bryden is also looking at is the audit reports fit for purpose and whether there should be other things that should be more future looking that should be incorporated in the audit. So I think that report is going to be very key in this debate and we'll also need to feed into the PJC uh, debate as well. Um, I mean, there's this, um, I think, a common theme across UK and Australia at the moment is this issue of providing non-assurance services. Um, well, it is a key project too of the IESPA yeah. at the moment. So they're looking at going to exposure draft in December with changes to the code which deal with uh, non-assurance services and, and providing more explicit guidance to members as to what they can and can't do yeah. and what, what services they can and can't provide with respect to impeding independence. Yeah. Uh, and look, it may only be a perceived independence issue, but at the end of the day, that brings instability to uh, to the trust that the users of these reports have if there is any type of perception around problems with independence. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we need to deal with the perception issue. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of media attention on this as well. Um, I think it's unrealistic for there to be audit-only firms because the audits have become complex. They need different expertise. Like, for example, if an entity is using financial instruments, then you'll need someone with financial ex instruments expertise on that audit engagement. I think it's the matter of dealing with the perception issue. Uh, the code already has some restrictions Yes. if the entity is a public interest entity. Correct, yes. As well as if that particular service, let's say you're doing a valuation service, and that has a material impact on the financial statements, then you shouldn't be doing it. Because it raises a self-review threat. Yeah. So uh, there's already some um, safeguards in, and maybe those needs to be enhanced right. uh, and more strict. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what ISPA does, because it's not only the non-assurance, project, it's also the fees project, which is related to non-assurance services. The IESPA are aiming for both of those projects to go into exposure draft in December. I'm on the fees task force, which is chaired by the Australian board member, Ian McPhee, and it has been a very, very topical issue in terms of how far we can go with respect to providing guidance that's principles-based on fees and when there may be an issue with, that may impact 
perceptions of independence and even potential equality, and then how that then balances with competition and consumer laws in all the various regions. So it is a very delicate balancing act that the ISPA have had to undergo in order to provide enhanced guidance in this area. Whether it will go far enough, I think that'll be an interesting question that the regulators may debate next year. Yeah. So now moving on to our next slide, um, we have also touched on here uh, some of the, the some of the local implications that have impacted on the restructured code, being the Royal Commission into um, misconduct into the banking superannuation and financial services industry. So, would you like to make some comments? as to our local environment that has impacted the restructured code or the Australian provisions within the restructured code? Yes, yeah, so the, I think the Royal Commission highlights the cost of ethical lapses uh, because as we can see on the slide, uh, uh, there's eight, it's over eight billion across those five entities and the government is now going to ban grandfathered commissions as well from 2021. Um, ASIC is already, uh, I think, taking action. Um, and I think uh, earlier this week there was action against Westpac as well from Austrac. So I think over the next year we'll see um, things coming out from the regulators in this. It's, uh, I think, uh, one of the most telling Comments and I'd like to uh, read this comment from Commissioner Hey now, Joe, mm -hmm. because I think it has um, implications not only in financial services but across. It, it can be applied to any any industry. So, it, the from looking at the report, I think this is one of the most telling statements he made. He said there can be no doubt that the primary responsibility for misconduct in the financial services industry lies with the entities concerned and those who managed and controlled those entities, i.e. the boards and senior management. Mm -hmm. Nothing that is said in this report should be understood as diminishing that responsibility. Everything that is said in this report is to be understood in the light of that one undeniable fact. It is those who engage in misconduct who are responsible for what they did and for the consequences that followed. So I think that is, uh, from reading the Royal Commission report, I think that's one of the most telling statements and it can be equally applied whether you apply it in Australia or UK, uh, that you know, ultimately it's those who uh, manage the entity that should hold responsibility for what happened. First and foremost, where yeah. the auditors will conduct a, conduct the audit in accordance with the auditing standards, but I think there's a there's a misunderstanding by users as to the scope of the audit and what the audit can actually provide with respect to the the examination that takes place because it is done on a sampling and a materiality level. Yeah. Not every transaction will be looked at and there won't necessarily be the detection of some of these issues that have come up mm -hmm. through the Royal Commission. So I think that's where it really does tie it back yeah. to the preparers of this information yeah. and how we go about ensuring that there are provisions that, rep that relate to those. And I think the IESPA are, are looking very strongly at that at the moment through their projects through NAS and fees yeah. with respect to not only providing provisions for the auditors to consider, but also providing those charged with governance with very clear direction as to what needs to happen there. And that will affect our accountants in business who need to apply those relevant sections of the code. Yes, agreed. We might leave that question there and move on to our second question. Is the Australian Code APES 110 harmonised with the international code as issued by the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants? We have really touched on this in, in our previous discussions, yeah. but just to give our members some understanding of how the two interact together, would you say that the IESPA code is updated first and then the APSB follow with changes? Yes, uh, so we use our base document is the IESPA code. So we do Australian changes and we add uh, Australian additions to it. 
but the base document is the ISBA code, which we uh, APSB reproduces in Australia under copyright agreement uh, with the International Federation of Accountants. Um, and so if you comply with APS 110, it will ensure compliance with the ISPA code as well. Mm. And um, that is why there's global uh, convergence, because the ISPA code is used as the base document uh, in over 120 countries. Mm. Mm. Uh, and I think there's a good uh, proportion of the G20 countries that follow it as well. So there's, we can't say that in Australia the conditions are necessarily more onerous than in other jurisdictions. But I think we are in a very unique position in Australia whereby we have a domestic local standard setter being the APESB, which actually puts us in very high esteem on the international, uh, land, in the international landscape with ethics and professional standard setting. There's many jurisdictions I've found from my experience on the IESPA don't have a local standard setter to look at ethics and professional standards in other disciplines in the accounting profession. So a lot of other jurisdictions only have the code, which is principles-based, whereas we have a suite of other pronouncements that guide our members to how they should be going about providing services to ensure that they are meeting those ethical requirements from the code, but also that a specific engagement uh, related uh, to the services that are being provided. Yes, so um, in most jurisdictions you will find that it's either the audit standard setter that controls the code, like like the UK, or uh, it could be with a professional body. So the Australian setup of separately having a PSP and then having you know the standards being implemented by three bodies is quite unique, and I have not seen it in any other jurisdiction uh, where this model operates. So in that sense, uh, I think the accounting bodies uh, were quite, uh, like you could say, a pioneer in creating this model. Um, and in respect of other professional standards, I think the only global competitor APSB has is the AICPA, because they also have uh, standards in valuation, uh, forensic, uh, but they don't have as, I don't think they do much in insolvency, uh, which is one we'll be discussing shortly. So I think our range is more comprehensive uh, than the AICPA, but that's the only other jurisdiction that I'm aware of that has the code plus some engagement standards. For example, they also have one on financial planning. So. Uh, so do you find then that the National Standard Setters Conference that you, you attend on behalf of Australia, do they tend to look towards Australia as being an example for developing professional standards and standards, and standards that look at ethical issues in other disciplines across the profession? Because really, if, if ethics is just combined with audit standard setting, then really, as you said, there's only 7% of auditors within our country. Mm. We're not looking at all the other services that our members are providing and providing them with guidance as to what is considered best practice, what is considered ethical practice, uh, where we should be. Yeah, I mean, I'm not privy to how all the processors work uh, internationally, but I have heard that they, at the ISBA level, they do look at APSB submissions a bit differently because they know that we have a higher sophistication across the profession and we are not just... And you're independent. And we are independent as well. You're not just representing the yeah. views of the professional bodies, you're, yeah. you're independent. Sometimes we do take different views from Absolutely. the pro professional bodies I think as well. we have experienced that over the last 12, 13 years where the yeah. professional bodies have not always shared the same views as the APSB, but I think yeah. one of the, 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 the underpinning fundamental elements of our profession and where our standards have held up very, very well is that there is that independence uh, yeah. involved in that standard setting. So it's not just necessarily the views of one professional body or their membership that is being taken into account with respect to this standard setting. Yeah, that's correct. Which may be frustrating for our members from time to time, 
but really in the yeah. scheme of protecting what our profession stands for and remaining that we can that remaining being considered as a profession then that independence is critical to what we do that is correct i mean the guiding principle for the APSB's public interest what's in the public interest which you could in, uh, equate to what is in the consumer's interest as well so um, and sometimes that means it may not align with members' commercial interests. No, absolutely, absolutely. But I think the protection of the public interest, if we go back to our studies at undergraduate university level, that's what underpins our profession. So for example, the legal profession have their obligation, their duties to the court. Yeah. The medical profession has the obligation to do no harm. The cornerstone of the accounting profession is the protection of the public interest. Yeah, and that's why it's in the first paragraph of the code. Right, right. I think it's worth us reminding ourselves of that every every now and again because it is very, it's it's not uncommon for those interests to compete, yeah. the commercial interests and the public interest um, to compete. And I think that's probably what has resulted in a number of these particularly high level corporate collapses or. Um, or issues with audit yeah. where potentially there've been competing interests and and really something that should have had a higher priority has received a lesser priority. Lesser priority, that's mm. right. Okay, it's a really interesting uh, conversation to have. I've included some slides here just for our members' benefit of where the code has been adopted and that list is growing considerably but we won't go through those slides in great depth. That's really for our members just to take away and get an understanding of where the global adoption of the ISPA code is. So now we'll look to question three, which uh, is in relation to the structural changes to the code. So on that, what are the key structural changes to the restructured code and why were they considered necessary? I think we have touched on this before as well. The previous code had the requirements and the guidance mixed up. Yes. So some, so people could read it, some might read it and say, well, that's really guidance, I don't really need to do it. Um, so there was a, um, a push from the regulators that for them to enforce, it has to be really mandatory. And it has to be clear that this is mandatory. So now you will find that paragraphs will have the R in front of it. Yes. So that is a requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in bold as well. So people generally understand that the bold paragraphs are mandatory. Um, and so make no mistake, this code is enforceable. Mm. So come 1st January 2020, people should be up to date with it because you don't want to be on the wrong side of a regulator when they have, you know, they have this code to enforce. Correct. Um, and remember in Australia with the USB issuing ASA 102 for Corporations Act audit, audits, this will have legal backing. Uh, so that, that's something to uh, keep in mind. I think also too from a professional conduct perspective, uh, it, in the past it has been difficult if a member has potentially breached another professional standard to make a specific link back to the code. But I think some of the changes to the Australian Code too now also cascade off the other professional standards off the code. Yeah. So it makes it very clear that if you're in breach of one of the other professional standards, then you are in breach of 110. And I think that gives the professional bodies and their professional conduct programs a lot more scope to manage members' behaviour and conduct with respect to the code and does give it a lot more gravitas with with respect to managing these issues as they as they present themselves. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, I mean, one of the changes is uh, we also include the, all the pronouncements in the introduction to the new code so that it's clear that it's not only the code, but in certain instances you might have a specific professional standard that is applicable as well, like valuation or forensic accounting. And a thing that a lot of people forget is that they feel that these standards are mainly applicable to firms, mm. but you have to remember that anything in the 200 series is applicable to members in business as well. Absolutely. So the valuation standard, forensic tax, in uh, financial planning, 
that has a two in front of it. So that means that there are provisions in there uh, that uh, members in business need to be aware of as well. Mm, so it's not just those working in public practice. Yeah. Although a lot of financial planning services would be conducted potentially yeah. within a public practice, they don't have to be. Have to be, yeah. No, that's right. And so therefore, anyone providing these particular services, even if they're a member in business working in tax for a major corporate or a smaller business, then they do have obligations under their professional membership with respect to the code. I think quite often members in business potentially uh, don't, don't look at the code as often as they should with respect to getting guidance to the services that they provide. And, and from a, a reader of these standards, they are very, very easy to digest. They're not overly lengthy and they provide very clear guidance as to what we need to do that's quite simple to implement really. So it, it really is in our members' best yeah. interest that they do become familiar with, with that 200 series. Yeah. I mean, a qualification, of the, the, it's 110 standard is a bit lengthy because it's 200 yes, pages. Yes, 200 pages, yes. So that's the code. We'll blame the international yeah, colleagues we'll for that. that. <laughs> I mean, half of it is independence. Uh, and one of the other structural changes is bringing the members in business part to the front. So. Oh. Now we will have part one, and then part two is the members in business section, which was previously, if you recall, at the back. At the back, so they have brought it forward in acknowledgement that 70% of the profession is members in business. So if you are a member in business, let's put those parts in front of the code, and then you go to part three, and part uh, part three is about members in practice, and then part four is about the independent standards. So if you are not in audit, then you don't have to worry about part four. Um, so I think the new structure is more user friendly. Yes. Uh, and for and no excuses for our members in business now. <laughs> yeah, because it's now right next to each other. Yes. Earlier, one of the things was that you know you read part A of the code, then there's about 70 pages not relevant to you, and then the other part is at the back. Yeah that excuse won't do anymore. No, no. So I've included some slides following this uh, as to what it, what it looks like. Um, but what we might do is just go through the, uh, go through the highlights of the, the restructured Australian code just to bring some attention to those particular elements that are a little bit more unique to the Australian context. Yeah, so uh, I think you have it on the, that oh, slide. Slide too far. Um, no. Next one. I think uh, one of the things uh, is that uh, what we have done in Australia is um, we have developed enhanced uh, PDF features, and this is really to help members navigate the code. Um, you'll have bookmarks, pop-up de of definitions. There'll be dynamic links, so the, you know you can just click on it and it will move to the other section, the cross-referred section. This actually took a lot of time. It took uh, our graduates like nearly two months right. to, to do this because yeah. it's a huge document. Then we had to go through a process of cross-checking and all of that. Um, and I think this is a good alternative to the e-code that is developed by ISBA uh, for the global code, because this uh, has pretty much 70% of whatever the e-code has, uh, and members should find it easy to navigate. And we are going to do the similar changes to our other ones as well. Um, I mean, from Australian context, there's the PI definition, the public interest entity definition, and we put in private health insurers as a uh, likely pie that was not there before. Um, so though, other than that, I think most of the changes are similar to what was there before uh, in the extent code. The, I think one of the things that we need to highlight is over the conceptual framework. Yes. Um, in the previous, there, there, there is a mentality that as long as you always come up with a safeguard that you could continue doing an activity. Uh, in the restructured code, um, no longer 
can you have that mentality because it's now quite clear that in certain instances you cannot do an activity. And I think that is the uh, major difference in the conceptual framework and then they have taken it right throughout the code. So you cannot always come up with a safeguard. In some instances you'll have to say, no, I can't do that activity. That engagement. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's an important concept for our members to understand that while safeguards are there to mitigate threats to the fundamental principles, they can't always mitigate to an appropriate level which would allow the member to continue on with that engagement and that, they, that sometimes they're, the only really way to handle those particular threats is to resign from those engagements, especially where there's threats, for example, like a self-review threat or intimidation threat or a familiarity threat. They can be quite difficult uh, to to eliminate or to manage to an appropriate level. Yeah. So, like, if you uh, look at this slide, Joe, you can see that there are three ways in which a member can deal with threats. You can either eliminate the circumstances, you can apply safeguards. So, for instance, let's say you might have uh, you have audit engagement, and that one of the team members has a relationship with that the client. Client, you remove the person, right? Correct. So that, that's a way to deal with it. Um, then, uh, so that that could be applying safeguards because you have dealt with it. Mm. Then the third one is there might be a circumstance that there's no option but to decline performing it, um, that activity or service. Now, in the previous code, if you read it in a principles-based manner, you should have come to the same conclusion. But obviously, people were not. Mm. So they have now made it very explicit that this is what we expect of you mm. in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Do we expect, given the hype of activity that's happening globally now by regulators and by governments, that this conceptual framework may change more and become even more direct with respect to instructions around managing these threats? Uh, I have not uh, heard about it, okay. <laughs> whether that's going to change. But I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a balance because if you become too prescriptive, then the thing is people will always find something that doesn't fit within that. Or they will try and, or potentially some may try to find ways to get out or loopholes to yeah, get out of that, so which that's is not right. in the spirit of, of really what we're trying to do globally here. Yeah, and so that's why the principles-based approach works, uh, because if you do it in a principles-based manner, you should come up with the same answer. Of course, there are there is some prescription in the code, like when you get to audit partner rotation, yep. there are clear rules, uh, but generally, I think, maybe 60-70% of the code is still principles-based mm. so that it can uh, fit into different situations. Mm. Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see if that remains over the longevity over 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 time in, in the foreseeable future, yeah. given where we're at with the amount of interest in our profession with respect to quality, independence, uh, and potentially services that that should or should not be provided in addition to audit services or assurance type services as well. Yeah. So we'll just move through to the, the next slide with respect to the enhanced conceptual framework. Can you talk us through uh, this particular approach? So I think the base thing of identifying threats, evaluating threats and addressing threats, that's not changed that much. But uh, in the outer circle you can see exercise uh, professional judgment, remain alert for new information. Mm -hmm. So that remain uh, alert for new information, that's something new. Mm -hmm. So what they're implying is that it's a continuous process. So it's not about... It's not a set and forget. Set and forget. Don't do it at the start and then forget about it. No. You have to continuously evaluate... Uh, it has to be front of mind during the entire engagement. Yes, that's correct. And then also the use of the reasonable third party test. Historically, when the reasonable third party test was used, people tend to think that it has to be another accountant. No. 
So they now made it clear that it doesn't necessarily have to be another accountant. Okay. So that's more along the lines of our Corporations Act test yeah. with respect to, to reasonable third party. third party. That it has to be an informed third party, uh, that it has to be someone with an, with an appropriate level of knowledge, but uh, not necessarily from the industry that we're in. Yeah. That actually is it's an interesting concept that opens up a whole lot of uh, other um, questions around how other people, other professions may perceive our profession and determine whether what we're doing is appropriate or not. Or not, yeah. Mm, very interesting. And I think the next one is about independence uh, and um, they have been quite clear that in the conceptual framework applies to independence in the same way it applies to uh, the other fundamental principles and other services. So. They have made it quite explicit mm -hmm. that the framework they have used throughout the independent section is the same conceptual framework. And that's why it's important to understand the conceptual framework because once you understand the conceptual framework, all the 200 pages become easy mm. because what happens is that same framework is applied in different situations. That's all the code is doing. Yep, exactly. Now, with respect to independence, some members may think that independence only applies if you're doing an audit, that that's the only time it's it's really relevant. What, would you have any comments on that? Or? No, I don't think that's the only uh, instant it's uh, relevant. I mean, we'll be shortly talking about liquidator independence as well. So, and liquidators think it's a higher level of independence than auditor independence. Right. Uh, and there's a subtle difference um, which we can talk about shortly. Um, I think there's also like uh, a valuation practitioner may do an independent experts report. So I don't think independence is limited to audit. Uh, independence can even apply for financial uh, planning services. Mm. Um, Which I think potentially ties into the IESPA project on role and mindset. They were using the terms originally called professional skepticism, but that has been um, ring fenced for audit. Mm -hmm. Now the ISP have moved towards role and mindset and really defining the fact that the role and mindset of the professional accountant does have to take into consideration these issues which traditionally may have thought, um, professional accountants may have thought only applied to one domain, but really it applies to everything that we do within the profession. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, it will be interesting to see where IS lands. We will, in Australia, we might have an issue because we use independence for liquidators and then for valuation and so on. Mm. Um, so it, it will be interesting. I mean, personally, I don't think it, it was a good outcome that they say professional skepticism only applies to auditors. Auditors, mm. because I mean, I saw an article a couple of months ago about doctors and talking about professional skepticism. So uh, I think you can't really ring fence it no. to a profession or within a profession mm. because in any profession you can exercise professional uh, skepticism which is about a questioning mind mm. and you know, seeing what evidence you have to support your opinion. Mm. So And not taking what's provided to you on face value. Face value. Mm. And that is important in tax, that's important in financial planning, that's important yeah. In insolvency, that's important across the spectrum of services yeah. that are embodied in, in our constitution as being public accounting services. So it really is important that members have that front of mind regardless of the services that they are providing. So we might just move along now to question five. Have We really have touched on this throughout our conversation today, but have there been any specific changes, or let's touch on the specific changes in the code for members in business. So on the slide, I think you can see some of the changes that you have uh, laid out, mm -hmm. and I think we covered some of these in our May webinar as well. Yes. Um, I mean, I, the point I'll make with NOCLA is that it's around the concept of substantial harm to a range of stakeholders, so it's not every minor non-compliance issue. I think that's been one of the hurdles that a lot of our members have had to get their head around in that it's not every single type of compliance issue, so if, you, if your client is speeding, for example, that's not something you would have yeah. to have to report. Yeah. So that took a little while for some of our members to get around, get their head around. I think it's really important, those key words around substantial harm 
or with respect to the to the financial statements that are being prepared and the users yeah. of those financial statements. I think it's very specific to the engagement that the accountant is involved with. Yeah, I mean, this is when you look back to the uh, GFC. This is the Lehman Brothers example, yes. uh, where you know it collapsed after audit report was issued a few months later. Um, so uh, I think you had to make a decision when there's substantial harm. It's not like I, I miss filing the tax return or something like that. Uh, where you, if it's not precluded by law or regulation, that you can you first work through. There's a process. You work through internally, and if all fails, then you can report to a regulator who can take action. And it's it's about reg reporting to appropriate regulator, not about going to the media. No. Uh, it's it's about uh, you know so that somebody can take corrective action. So it would be in the case of most of our members, it would be ASIC, APRA. the ATO, APRA, maybe Austrac. Austrac, environmental regulators, for example, if the yeah. engagement was around emissions or yeah. things like that, and assurance service in that particular area. Yeah. So it's very clear that it's who you are to report to and only when the law does not preclude that reporting. Yeah. And for a number of our members that are working in tax, the law did preclude um, disclosure to, to, the, to the, the tax regulator for a substantial yeah. amount of time. That has changed recently with, with, whistleblowing. with whistleblowing protections. And we did touch on that. If you want more information on those particular changes, we did cover that quite extensively in a webinar earlier in the year that you can access on our website or via our YouTube links as well. So that then brings me to the question of how all these changes to the code are going to affect uh, other APSB standards and pronouncements. What's the process at the moment for the APSB and the, and the board in respect to all the other pronouncements that we are very lucky to have in Australia? So we have been uh, quite busy. Obviously. <laughs> updating all of our pronouncements. So at the moment, we have issued as exposure draft 19 of the 20 other pronouncements. And the last one remaining is the financial planning services one, which we expect to issue shortly. Out of the ones that have gone out for exposure, we have finalized eight standards. And if you go on our website, it's separately categorized as effective from 1st of January 2020. We are expecting to issue three more this month. Yes. Um, APES 345 on prospective financial information and APES 350 due diligence committees, which are mainly corporate finance, transactional advisory uh, type uh, standards. And then we'll also be uh, trying to finalize APES 310 client monies. And then there are some pronouncements which uh, are out for exposure. We'll get comments back. Uh, but our aim is to try and finalize all of it by 31st December. 2019. So then they're aligned with the operative date of the code. Oh, yeah. mm. Now I know that this project has looked at aligning, first and foremost, aligning the pronouncements to the changes to the code, but I also am aware that the APSB have taken this opportunity to look at anything that may have been on the issues register that the professional bodies have raised with the APSB. That is correct. So I think, um, and we recently updated our issues register, so you might see that where the standards are finalized, those things are now gone. and. We have cleaner sheets on oh, outstanding issues. Fantastic, a clean slate for yeah. the start again. <laughs> yeah, so by the end of the year, the aim is that most standards will have very little uh, issues outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the progress is good, and we hope to get everything updated by the end of the year. Great, and there's some details on just those last few slides that I've flipped through that summarize that conversation and also just provide a little bit more formal uh, advice to our members as to what the process is for the APSB. Now that moves us into APS, APS 330 Insolvency Services. That's recently undergone quite a significant review. Uh, what was the, why was that update necessary and what are the key changes that our members need to be aware of with that particular standard? So I think uh, on the slide that uh, members can see, you have summarized some of the issues that drove the changes to APES 313 Solvency Services, the illegal phoenix activity where people, you know, they close up one company and open up another company and it's, you know, different, may, it may be different people, but essentially it's the same person behind. Uh, ASIC was concerned about it. 
some business relationships of insolvency practitioners. So all of these have made us take another look at the standard. Uh, we have had conversations with ASIC as well. This might be where those independence issues are starting to creep in. I know one of our board members who practices in insolvency highlighted to us a number of concerns around other services that insolvency practitioners may be offering uh, to, to mix in with their, their business model uh, that potentially may create some issues around independence for them. Yes, that's correct. And here's where there's, a, I think, a, where the liquidators argue that it's a higher bar of independence compared to auditors. Because uh, one of the challenges we had is that there are legal principle, uh, precedents in Australia that talk about the point of view. So in the code, we talk about the point of view of a reasonable person, which we talked about before. Yep. The legal precedents talk about a fair-minded lay observer. Right. Which is a lower threshold. Fair-minded lay observer. <laughs> it doesn't right. Have so it doesn't necessarily have to be an informed, informed person. Right. Right. So this is the debate we had with ASIC about because ASIC was sort of saying, well, we don't think the reasonable informed third party is the same as the fair-minded lay observer. No. Right. So what in the end the final solution was we kept the global definition of independence in APES 330, but we made reference that there are legal precedents in Australia in respect of liquidated independence. And then we explained this further in Appendix 1. So Appendix 1 goes through some of these differences um, and so highlights to uh, liquidators that the bar of independence is higher in this instance because of the legal overlay uh, in it. So that, that was a substantial uh, change. And the other one is we also did a template for the declaration of uh, independence and indemnities mm -hmm. about relevant relationships. So that, uh, because that is a cornerstone of the, of H330, because essentially the liquidate independence rules is in F330. Mm. It's not in the code. Right. Right. And at a at the beginning or in the of the process of uh, liquidation, you need to provide this declaration to demonstrate your independence. So we have also now provided in Appendix Two a format which complies with the requirements of F330, so that members can take it and use it uh, when they are. Uh, completing these declarations. Which will make that significantly easier, significantly easier. for our members practicing in this yeah. area. And I believe that this whole process of the review of APES 330 was done in cooperation with ARETA, uh, which is the um, Insolvency Practitioners Professional Association. That is correct. Um, we have had a long relationship with ARETA, um, going back 10 years. We have always worked collaboratively to ensure that our standards align. Um, and of course, we we are more principles-based, and we have only H330, while uh, RETA has the code as well as they have a lot of practice standards. Mm. But we try to keep it at a principles-based level, and we don't provide as much guidance. Uh, so they do provide more uh, because it's a specialised area. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's still in our members' best interest to to be aware of uh, the changes to APS 330, but also to to leverage off their membership with ARETA to make sure that they are getting yeah. some of those specific yeah. uh, requirements covered off. And then another part is I think the professional fees and expenses. We have done another appendix on that as well. Uh, it reflects current court decisions uh, because sometimes people overcharge, so you have to be careful, don't overcharge, because it must be necessary and proper for that engagement. Um, and also, you cannot charge time for communication with professional bodies and regulators who are inquiring about member disciplinary issues. Right, <laughs> that, that was an issue. That was an issue. They were, Goodness. They were charging that to clients. So right. now it's very specific that those sort of professional body surveillance and regulatory surveillance 
are not things that you can charge to your clients. No, and by doing so, you're in breach of, of, of your professional exactly. standards, which yeah. means you're in breach of the code. Yeah. Right. I think we have to continually yeah. remind members that it's, it's not just in breaches of, of one particular professional standard. By doing that, because now the standards cascade off the code, you are in breach of the code. That brings us to our next question. Uh, APES 230, Financial Planning Services, is currently undergoing a review. Will there be significant changes as a result of the Royal Commission and how are the changes likely to impact members working in financial planning? So this, as I said, is the final one yes. in, the, in the suite. Um, actually, APES 230, which was issued in 2013, has held up remarkably well. Exceptionally well, Exceptionally given the recommendations well. of the Hain Royal Commission, yeah. yes. And for members who looked at APES 230 in 2013 yes. and transition to the Tier 1 remuneration requirements, which are fee for service, I think they would hardly be impacted by everything that's going on. Right. So uh, the standard has held up well. Um, I think uh, even when you are looking at the FASIA code, I feel that 230, if you take Tier 1 remuneration, is higher and more stricter than the FASIA code. The approach um, that uh, the task force is currently thinking of taking on 230 is a two-stage approach. First, let's do deal with the code-related changes yes. to get it in line by the start date of 1st January 2020. And then let's have a broader consultation because now the government has released its roadmap as well. Yes. Let's have a broader consultation on financial planning. So we are hoping to take a consultation paper to the board uh, for the second stage um, for uh, to get more engagement and get a broader uh, sense of what's happening. So these particular changes that may come through to this standard, when would when would we be likely to see those coming through an exposure draft? Sometime next year? Yeah, it will be sometime next year. The code-related ones we are trying to get out this month. Uh, yes. Uh, but the more broader issues, we'll initially do a consultation paper and see what people say. And uh, my sense is even if we get it out this year, the closing date for submission might be March 2020. Right. So we are looking at potentially mid next year for actual exposure draft. And for our members' benefit, when these particularly topical standards come up for review, you do have task, for, task forces that are responsible for, for providing recommendations to the board, and those task forces comprise of leaders within the profession, not just from professional bodies as well, but from other areas of the industry, is that correct? That's correct. So we have subject matter expertise from, I mean, the professional bodies nominate people onto the task force as well, as well as we have subject matter experts who are either practitioners or retired practitioners from that area. Right. So that brings that independence back yeah. as well. Okay. So that brings us to our last technical question of the day, which is in respect to the PJC inquiry into audit quality. So the Parliamentary Joint Commission Joint Committee issued this uh, or announced this inquiry uh, about a month or so ago in respect to audit quality and disciplinary conduct. How is the APSB going to respond to this particular inquiry? So we did have a roundtable last. Um, last week in Sydney as well and got stakeholders in. I mean, APSB's uh, mandate is, will be a bit more restricted in comparison to, let's say, the Auditing Standards Board. Right. Uh, because we can only talk about the audit independence issues. Um, so we will be making a submission and they have actually requested us to make a submission. Um, I believe they've requested um, the ISB and the IAASB to, to make a submission and they're planning on making a joint submission. Those two boards yeah. of IFAC are planning on making a joint submission with respect to this inquiry. Yeah, as well. I think the request has gone quite broadly mm. to a lot of stakeholders. I think we have to be careful about terminology because sometimes people talk about consulting services, but if there's no audit relationship, there's nothing really stopping a firm providing a whole range of services to an entity. Yes. Um, so the media sometimes, I think, blows things out of proportion. 
where they have audit relationship, then the court does have certain restrictions mm. in place. And I mean, it's a separate argument, as you said, um, whether you know those rules need to be strengthened, and we'll have to see what comes out of the ISBA process. I need to emphasize that while the media is trying to draw parallels with the UK, our frameworks are quite different, mm. right? As I said, we have a whole range of standards uh, dealing with other services, while in the UK, you'll only get, uh, I think the ICAW has a standard on client monies. It, it's very restricted on mm -hmm. other services. They don't say much on other services. Well, we do. While we do. So drawing parallels, just because it's happening in the UK, uh, is a bit of a danger without understanding the framework. Mm. Um, and most auditors would be members of the professional association, so therefore these APS standards apply. Yeah, and the other thing is we have a APS 320, which is a firm-wide standard. Yes. UK doesn't have a firm-wide standard on quality control. The US does. Or risk management as well. With yeah, risk management as well, and plus terms of engagement. Yes. So even if you are in an area where there is no APS standard, you still need to comply with the code, Yep. Quality control, risk management, and terms of engagement. engagement. Absolutely. So, so there is. So I think there's already quite a, a range of controls in place for our members, yeah. regardless of what they're providing. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's uh, there could be requests for standards on other services, which is a separate issue. But we have to be careful that uh, we don't draw parallels uh, with the UK and first study the framework. So that will be something that we will be putting across uh, in our submission to the PJC um, about what exists in Australia, the additional service-specific standards, uh, so that they get, uh, I think, education on uh, what's here. So it's a clear message that let's not get on the bandwagon of America and Europe and the UK with respect to audit. Let's take a breath and let's look at what controls we've currently got in place before we go and make widespread changes. Yeah, I mean, it's about, it's not about defending the status quo. I think no. we should always look at how can we enhance what we have, but in the same token, we need to first equalize, you know, what's here. I mean, So we're comparing apples with apples. We are comparing apples with apples. Mm -hmm. For example, in the UK, under the U current system, the UK FRC, they cannot take an auditor to task without going through ICAW or one of the other professional bodies. Which doesn't happen here. Which doesn't happen here. No. ASIC can go directly and take people to task. That's right. So there, there are differences in these mm. frameworks. So it sounds like from the UK example, they potentially could have a more conflicted model, given yeah. that the ICAW would be representing the interests of their members, but then also being predominantly responsible for their discipline rather than the fact that quite often within the Australian context, we will wait for the outcome of a disciplinary proceeding from the, from ASIC or the ATO, for example, or APRA before we would take action from a professional body perspective yeah. with respect to the members or that professional membership of that particular individual. That is correct. Okay. That brings us, I think, to our final uh, question of the, of the day, which is about where we can find more information. So I think that's really around members being aware that they can access CPA Australia's website, the APSB's website, yeah. as well as our YouTube channels and links. Yeah, um, and uh, I mean, we have the apps as well. And uh, just to draw attention that we are working on two, two documents. One is the audit partner rotation update for that in line with the new code, so expect that by the end of the year. And then the other thing is we are working with all three professional bodies on updating the independence guide for the new code. So these two publications are scheduled to, one will be done by this year and the other one will be early next year, but that should help with the implementation of the code. And the APSP is also undertaking a review of its website and we are working on um, a new website as well in the background, but that will probably be next year as well. Fantastic. 
Well, Chana, that brings us to the end of our webinar today. I would like to sincerely thank you for your time today. I think it's been a really informative session and we look forward to what the professional standards and ethics landscape presents to us next year. This is our final ethics and professional standards webinar for this year, but we do look forward to working closely with you again next year for updating our members in, on ethics and professional standards. So thank you for your participation today. Thanks, so Thank you for the opportunity and it's great to speak to so many people uh, about what's happening in professional and ethical standards. And um, if it, as we, this is the last one, uh, I'd like to wish everyone all the best uh, for the end of the year as well. Thanks very much, Tana. Michelle, that takes care of our end. Back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Josephine. Kosa, there were three questions. Uh, do you want to try and handle those now or do you want to rather handle those um, post-session? Let's just see what they are if we can. All right, shall yeah, I, okay. I'll read them for you. Yeah, so there was David Dring who says, how does the removal of commissions incentives, the, sorry, incentivize those working as FPs and how does this ensure a better service for consumers? Ah, that's a, that's a very topical question, I think, around commission-based income. Uh, around in, in the financial planning landscape and I think it's, it's fairly clear that um, commission-based income is now seen as being conflicted uh, with issues around perception of independence and perception of whose best interest you're actually working in. Uh, I know when I was recently um, on an IS for engagement, I was reading some financial press overseas and that particular comment was raised in this particular article of which I photographed and sent over to Jana that uh, essentially wherever there's commission, there's always the doubt that potentially are you acting in that, in that particular client's best interest and why you very well may be. And having worked in the financial planning space myself and having had a very um, disciplined upbringing through and training through uh, doing uh, degree qualifications and the like, many members were completely acting in the best interest of the public and earning commission-based income. But there is doubt and there is issues with perception around that. Chana, would you have any comments around that? Yeah, I think the issue is who's paying you. Mm. Um, and with commissions, it's the, you know, the financial services entry that's paying you. So why not the client pay you for what you are doing? Mm. And uh, if there's a commission, uh, you rebate it. And I understand that now compared to 2013, now there's a lot more entities allowing the rebate uh, mechanism to apply. So it's about um, the perception on addressing the perception and maybe in most cases they do do the right thing. Uh, but like with most of these issues, it's a small number of well, the Hain Royal Commission hasn't really said it's a small number. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a it's a number of practitioners who yeah. don't necessarily come from our training background. I think that was a really important thing that I got had to get my head around that well, when you come from an accounting background and a postgraduate education background, of course you're going to put the client's best interest first. We have all those obligations upon us from the code. Of course we're going to put those first. But there, it's a profession that's being fraught with a number of advisors that haven't come from our same training background and therefore don't, may come from a sales mentality background which doesn't have that same client best interest mentality. Yeah, that's it. Mm. We hope that's answered that question. Michelle, back to you. Right. Any further? Right. Yeah, there was one other there. What logo and statements we must put in the stationery such as letterhead papers and things like that? So what logo and statements oh, must you put on our stationery? I think for that sort of information, the best thing to do would be go to our public practice toolkit, which has a whole heap of information as to what is applicable now and what's not. I know there were some frustrating changes for our members around the professional standards scheme. That's well and truly over with now. So there is very clear guidance as to what needs to be there, what logos you use, um, and what disclaimers that you use. But I would recommend that our members go to the Public Practice Toolkit on our website, which has all of that information and some documents they can download and use as templates as well. Thank you. Then the final question from um, Hon Pai Fong saying, whilst not wanting to continue the parallel bandwagon, UK is now considering mandatory change of auditor and audit firm rotations after several years of auditing. 
Is this mandated there? If this is mandated there, do you see the regulatory requirements in Australia following a similar approach? So, I mean, I think the partner rotation is already there. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's similar to the UK uh, in respect of partner rotation, although the cooling off period in the UK is five years off. So currently in Australia, we have three years off, and after 2023, it will move to five years off. So that will be aligned. So that will be aligned. Mm. I think the firm rotation is probably coming from the EU laws, not necessarily the UK, it's probably the EU laws. Mm. Um, and I mean, it would be interesting to see what happens with Brexit and all of that. Mm. Uh, I don't think the regulator here is pushing on firm rotation just yet, but if the parliament pushes them, then that could happen. That could could that potentially be an outcome of the PJC inquiry? Uh, that is, there is a potential for that. I would mm. think, uh, you know, it depends on how the parliament assesses the information that it receives. That it receives. Mm. Uh, I think, from a regulatory perspective, I have not heard that the regulators are pushing for such an outcome if other mechanisms can be used to deal with conflicts and non-assurance services. So that might be a worst case scenario. That could be a worst case scenario. Okay, so, it's, so really it's a staged approach. Let's, let's not make uh, dramatic changes as yet. Let's see what we can achieve via some systematic changes and then we'll assess, we'll continually yeah. assess. Uh, and it's not, I think uh, where there is firm rotation because in, in the EU it's 10 years, or if they can, if they go out for tender, I think you can extend to 20 years. And so far, I don't think it has shown that audit quality dramatically increases because of right. firm rotation. Okay. But of course, obviously, that's such a long period of time. It'll be quite a long period of time before we have some evidence, some empirical evidence as to what that does do to quality. Yeah. Mm. Michelle, back to you. Thank you very much. And I think that's all that we had there. We got, as I said, we had about 150 of the 204 stayed back for that. So they definitely wanted to hear the, the answers to those questions. So a very big thank you to both Josephine and to Chana for their input today. And we look forward to having you online again soon uh, for one of our future webinars with CPA. Just a reminder as you exit, you are redirected to a short survey form. If you can take the time to fill that out, that feedback goes back to CPA and to the presenters, and we really do appreciate that. So thank you very much to all of you, and I'll pop the music back on now. Thanks, Josephine. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Thanks. Michelle.